Good morning to uh, one and all. I hope um, you can hear me. It's wonderful to be able to have you with us this morning here at St Matthew's Church. My name is Tim Buckley. I'm vicar here in the parish and it's fantastic to be able to gather together as morning congregation to be able to worship together as family. Um, Today we're going to be sharing communion. I'm going to be taking communion and if you'd like to join with me later on you may want to take some bread and some wine and uh, prepare to do that later on in an agape kind of style. If you haven't got bread and wine available, you don't want to do that. We're going to be kind of receiving communion spiritually this morning. And so that's a, that's a wonderful thing to be able to do that. So if you'd like to join in with us later on, either with bread and wine or just spiritually receiving communion, you're particularly welcome. And it's wonderful to be able to gather together today. We're going to have a couple of hymns that um, you can enjoy, including at the end of the service, uh, a beautiful a cappella hymn that's been put together by a church in India, and I've got special permission from them to be able to play this beautiful uh, worship song this morning. I told them I was going to be using it in our live streaming service, and all the way from India, they send their love and prayers and affection. So it's wonderful to know that the church across the world is gathering, resourcing one another, and worshipping together. Um, before we begin our service, I'm going to pray in a moment just uh, a couple of notices. Um, church wouldn't be church without notices, even online. So just a reminder that the coffee morning is back on. We can't gather together physically, but we are able to gather together as church online on Zoom. And everybody's welcome to join us. It's 11 o'clock every Wednesday. Um, there's Zoom um, details and an address that's sent out every week on the church parish email. If you haven't got that email and you're not connected with us, uh, at the end of this, there's an email. At the end of these notices, there's an email address that you can uh send into and we'd love to connect you up with us but there's uh, about a wonderful gathering together on coffee morning bring your own coffee bring your own biscuits and cake and it's a fantastic opportunity to gather together every wednesday um, also just to say that prayer is such a key thing in our parish every tuesday morning uh, again on zoom at the moment there's a prayer gathering we'd love you to feel that you can come and join us for half an hour and pray for the parish for the city for our families for our connections and whether you're part of this parish or not, you're more than welcome to come and join us. Again, the details are sent out weekly by email. Continuing on that theme of prayer, we're absolutely convinced as a parish that prayer is vital in all we do. It underpins everything that we are and everything that we seek to do. So each month we decided to do a new venture to allow uh, new people to kind of engage in prayer in perhaps a new creative way. So from the 1st to the 7th of every single month, between 9 and 10 p.m. at night, just for one hour, we're going to have Zoom prayer for seven days, the beginning of every month. They're going to be led those nights by different people, myself and others across the parish. Um, there's going to be creative ways of praying. There'll be times of silence, times of reflective music. There'll be some uh, words and some ideas on the screen for people to pray. You don't have to have your camera on. You can just drop in and listen and participate. You don't have to pray out loud, but together praying for the sake of the city, for the sake of God's people, for the sake of the nation and the nations of this world. And each night we'll have a different theme. We're looking at the persecuted church. We're looking at young people. We're looking at generations. Uh, we're looking at all sorts of things. Um, so it's a great opportunity to uh, come and pray with us. And that will start on the 1st of February uh, tomorrow. So uh, do come and join us for seven nights of prayer for an hour, nine till 10. Uh, again, the email with the links will be sent out this week. So if you're not connected with us, that's our website, www.woodcombe.church. Uh, there's an, uh, a contact way that you can get through to the office to ask to be signed up, or you can email directly Tamsin on community at woodcombe.church, and she'll make sure that you're connected to all the news of the parish and the life of the church and the family so that you can be involved with us and uh, not miss out on anything that's going to be happening. <clears throat> We're going to begin in a moment with our opening hymn, um, Here I Am, Lord. But I just want to pray for us as we start, uh, for all of us gathered at homes, wherever you may be, in this city or in other places across the country. Let's just take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness. We thank you, Jesus, for your mercy. Lord, on this fourth Sunday of Epiphany, that revelation of who you are, we look to you again, King Jesus, and ask that you would be glorified in our midst. Lord, in our homes, with our families, wherever we may find ourselves today, you are with us. You are Jehovah Shammah. The Lord is there. You are Emmanuel. So, Lord, we look to you this morning. We ask for your grace and your strength. We look to seek your face. 
and ask that you would come by your Holy Spirit and stir us and encourage us. Help us to know your love, your grace, your healing power, your comfort, your care. Whatever our circumstances, good shepherd, we pray in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We're going to begin with our opening hymn. Uh, the words are going to be on the screen and uh, I do hope you can join in at home. Let's sing together, Here I Am, Lord. Apologies for the sound problems. Uh, one of the joys of going live when suddenly you realise the sound for the videos aren't working, but hopefully you're able to enjoy it at the end and hopefully that came back on for you. We're going to uh, begin uh, on this uh, fourth Sunday of Epiphany by um, just preparing our hearts in worship. One of the things uh, that I've become really aware of having a new pet dog is uh, the hazards in the winter of taking Benson out for a run across the wonderful fields and him coming home completely covered in mud. It's uh, started a whole new season of outdoor showers with the hose pipe, which he's not particularly keen on and neither am I as it's splashing everywhere. But it strikes home the real reality, the fact that in life, all of us can so easily become dirty by not just covered in mud, but actually in our hearts. And we recognize a need to cleanse ourselves, not just on the outside, but on the inside too. We don't use a hose pipe for that. But the great news is that God is a God who wants to cleanse us. God is a God who wants to restore us in right relationships. So there is a sense of cleanliness in our own hearts and lives and minds. We recognize that we fall foul of saying things that we shouldn't say or thinking things that we shouldn't think or failing to do the good things that we know we should do. But God is a merciful God, a kind God who seeks to restore us into relationship with him and with others. So we're just going to take a moment to let God's spirit speak to us, to challenge us, to remind us of those things that we need to put right. And we look to God as a God, the author and perfecter of our faith, who seeks to restore us. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. These words from Psalm 139, which express King David's heart for God to know him and to bring before him those things that displease God. I'm going to say these words from this psalm and then just pause for a moment and let the Holy Spirit search our hearts as we bring ourselves before him. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We say together, Lord our God, in our sin we have avoided your call. Our love for you is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Have mercy on us. Deliver us from judgment. Bind up our wounds and revive us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So may the God of all healing and forgiveness draw you to himself, cleanse you from all your sins, that you may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The collect then for today, the prayer for today, this is the fourth Sunday of Epiphany. Let's pray. God, our creator, who in the beginning commanded the light to shine out of darkness. We pray that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ may dispel the darkness of ignorance and unbelief. Shine into the hearts of all your people and reveal the knowledge of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We're going to um, hear our readings from uh, Veronica, uh, and following on from that, I'm going to share some thoughts and reflections. So thank you, Veronica. A Psalm of David, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. 
In your name I will lift up. The first reading is taken from Psalm 63. My soul thirsts for you. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. The second reading is taken from Revelations 1, verses 12 to 18, and it's from the New International Version of the Bible. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive for ever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Our Gospel reading is taken from John. Jesus prays to be glorified. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began.
we got there in the end with the sound. Sorry about the teething problems. Technology is a wonderful thing, and there seem to be some gremlins in the system today, but I think we got there eventually. Hopefully you've heard those, and thank you to Veronica. Father, I pray as I just share from your word this morning, would you stir our hearts and help us to hear from you, to hear what it is you're saying to us in this season, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Isaiah 55 verse 6 says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. A specific place to keep the keys in our house. Um, both Sarah and I seem to have this incredible capacity to lose particularly the car keys. And of course, it's always when you're just about to go out and trying to go out somewhere in a hurry. And so begins this litany of irritation and frustration and questions. I mean, really, really helpful questions like, where did you last have them? Uh, and oh, and oh, why didn't you put them uh, where they normally go? Which, of course, inevitably um, follows by a whole load of blame. What do you mean? Where did I last put them? You had them last. Um, and, and then, of course, begins the mad search for them. Checking coat pockets four times. And we have so many coats as well. And you know that the keys are there somewhere. I mean, the car's on the drive and it didn't drive itself there. Well, today's sermon is all about seeking, looking, not for a set of car keys, obviously, but for seeking God, seeking the very face of the King, the Alpha and Omega, as Revelation chapter one tells us, the God who is at the very beginning and will be at the end of everything, our lives and beyond, eternally beyond all time. And wow, what a face described to us in that passage in Revelation. No wonder John falls on his face as though in a dead swoon at the overwhelming, blazing face of Jesus. But as Jesus prayed in John 17, it's God's will that in us seeking him, we find him and receive eternal life. And that's not just talking about an entrance ticket to heaven. No, it, it's so much more than an entrance admittance to the afterlife, like you might get an entrance ticket from the National Trust to visit a palace. Jesus describes it thus. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That they know you. It's not like getting a ticket to visit a palace. It's more like actually being welcomed in, in order to sit and feast at the table with the king as a member of his family, to know him, to be fully known and loved by him. So how well do you know God? Well, let's return to the passage that we've been using throughout this sermon series found in 1 Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wickedness, then I'll hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Seek my face, says the Lord. His response of grace, forgiveness and healing seems to depend upon our desire and willingness to turn to him, to look for him, to seek him. I was recently reading uh, an account of one of the kings who followed sh on shortly after King David and his son Solomon as king of Judah. It's in 2 Chronicles chapters 14 to 16. And here, listen to this from verse 2. It's speaking of King Asa. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He took away the foreign altars and the high places and broke down the pillars and cut down the Asherim and commanded Judah to seek the Lord. King Asa sought God in his early years, doing wonderful things and seeing his nation blessed and prosper as a result of that, as he made these godly decisions and sought God in all of his actions. But sadly, as you read through this account in chapters 15 and 16, you see him begin to lose his way with the Lord. And this failure all really begins at a time of national pressure and crisis. Whereas before when they had been under attack, he and his nation had cried out to and in fact turned to God and seen miraculous de deliverance and provision. But suddenly and tragically, when confronted with a new challenge from the king of Israel, remember Israel and Judah were a divided kingdom. Well, instead of turning to God <clears throat> for wisdom and help, 
Asa comes up with a very human plan and turns instead to the king of Syria, actually an enemy of theirs, to resolve his problem, bribing him, as Chronicles records, with silver and gold from the treasures of the house of the Lord. He bribes him to effectively distract Israel to avert a a problem and a crisis with their own nation. It's clever. It's geopolitically very shrewd, but spiritually it's awful and has really far reaching consequences. Because King Asa is effectively saying, I can sort this. I don't need God. I've got a plan. I've got a quick fix idea. I can manage. I'm strong enough on my own. A clever human solution, yes, but not a heavenly one. Instead of seeking God, he opts for this quick fix human answer. And so it begins a slippery slope for Asa away from God, hardening his heart to the extent that at the end, having lost his way to God, he then becomes actually really ill. And we're told in chapter 16 at the end, his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek the Lord, but sought help only from physicians. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with doctors. They're a God-given gift. But this short sentence implies so much more. Asa would no longer look to God and now only considered human solutions. Solutions that brought no remedy and ended with his tragic, untimely death. So what happened to this man? How did he lose his way? I don't know. But it's a sobering and tragic tale of the consequences of turning away, turning aside from God. And in some ways, it underlines a really, really simple truth that we're either seeking God or we're not. And for King Asa at the end, he wouldn't even look to God when in terrible trouble. Because to seek God is to seek help from him. And it's to humble ourselves, to say, I need you. And I think for some of us, that is a really hard acknowledgement. But when we do, wow. God enters into our lives with all his fullness and grace when when we seek him, when we ask and look to him. Hebrews 11.6 says this, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And remember that passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 55 verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. It's like, it's like there's a window of opportunity that demands our attention and our action. And sometimes in times of great pressure and challenge, it can actually focus our minds on the things that really matter and on a God who, as we look to him, is able to do so much more than our best efforts, so much more than the exertions and best ideas of others. If my people seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and heal their land. King David, we're told in scripture, He's a man after God's own heart. I love King David. I want to be like him. And he gives us psalms that give us a glimpse into his spiritual life and reveal the true man beneath the kingly robes, behind the tales of giant slaying bravery. These are his words from Psalm 27, verse 8. May they be our words, not just in these challenging days, but every day. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. When David's being chased by Saul, you remember the story across the Judean desert, he calls out to God with desperation. From Psalm 63, verse 1, Earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So as I close today, hear again those pleading words from Isaiah 55, verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. I'd suggest that it's dangerous to put off seeking God for a more opportune time. I've talked to too many people who, with so much regret, wished they could redo whole seasons of their lives with God. There is a time to seek God, and that time is now. There was a time only two years into their sojourn in the kind of Sinai desert when the Israelites could have gone into Canaan and conquered the land, but they rebelled, they refused. They turned around and spent 38 years in the desert. There was a short 
window during which they could have obeyed, but it was fleeting and they chose wrong. 2 Corinthians 6 2 says, Behold, now is the favourable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. As the writer of Hebrews, with a memory of Israel's desert wanderings in mind, in chapter 3 urges us, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's pray. Jesus, may you fill our vision and may we pursue you. Lord, we recognise in our own lives and hearts there are times we've turned away from you because of shame or fear or busyness or a thousand other excuses. But you're a God who calls us to come home, who calls us to come near. Father, whatever our circumstances, whatever our distress or pain or sorrow or anger or fatigue or unbelief or confusion, whatever may overwhelm us, as we look to you, we see a face full of grace, mercy and love. You welcome us to come in and sit and eat with you. You stand at the door and knock. Lord, may our hearts not be so hardened that we fail to hear or fail to respond. And even as we open the door just a crack, your promise is to come in and love and eat with us and heal and restore and transform. You say of us, seek my face. Our hearts say, Lord, we do seek you. Stir in us this week, Lord, a desire to pursue you. And having pursued you, as you promise, to find you. Thank you for your grace, good shepherd, in calling us to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just in this moment before we come and share communion, we're going to just share our faith together. Uh, it's a faith that across the world, many Christians share in all languages and tongues in many, many different ways. And this morning we're going to use the Apostles' Creed to just declare our faith, our trust. They're not just words, but they're words that speak to our own heart and they're words that affirm out loud the truth that we feel in our hearts. Let's say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to um, have a time of prayer and intercession that Veronica is going to lead us. And hopefully we'll be able to make sure that the sound works if you just give us one moment. Let's just take a moment and prepare ourselves to pray. Gathering our prayers together, let us pray for the church and for the world. And as we come to prayer, we just settle our hearts and still ourselves as we look to God and ask for his peace. As Veronica leads us in this time of prayer, let's just be still, still our hearts. And Veronica will pray. Gathering our prayers together, let us pray for the church and for the world. We pray for the Christian church around the world, that it may find strength and confidence to lead its people with hope of a better time to come. Give its leaders the compassion to reach out and comfort all who suffer at this time. Help the church to reveal the mystery of your love and fill her with the spirit of truth. 
Let us be a united church in the face of global disaster, putting aside differences and thereby giving others in need a strong light to guide them through this time of darkness. May we all be bound together by your Holy Spirit. We give particular thanks for the work of all our clergy in this parish as they work to bring the Christian principles of love and forgiveness into the everyday lives of our community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Queen Elizabeth, for all government leaders and for all those leading medical efforts to contain and combat this virus around the world. Grant those leaders wisdom, humility and a sense of public service in their efforts to pursue the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who give so much of their lives to ensuring the relief of others at this time, both in this country and across the world. We remember all those who work in the health services. But we also remember the research scientists working to develop new vaccines, the factory workers producing and packaging those vaccines, the armed forces helping with those efforts, the assistants in care homes and hostel services, those that work in the funeral services, those that labour in the prisons, that teach in the schools and universities, those that work in the utility companies to keep electricity, water and gas, the transport services, the emergency services and also all the food producers and retailers. We remember all of those for whom staying or working at home is not an option and who take risks on our behalf to keep our world and our families cared for, fed and well. Please God, keep these people safe and let them all feel your love in a sustaining way. Protect by your mercy all your children, bless our families and renew our communities at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray for those who are sick at this time or who suffer in other ways. We remember those who are hungry, who feel a sense of despair for whatever reason. We ask, Lord, that you keep them in your heart and help them know your love. We pray particularly for those who are ill or suffering in any way in this parish. By your healing power, give to all who suffer your gift of wholeness and peace. Make our lives bear witness to your glory in the world and help us in this coming week to alleviate the sufferings of others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Finally, we pray for all who have died. We take some time now to bring to our minds those who are personally dear to us and we remember them now in this moment of silence. We also remember the 100,000 in this country who have already died from this virus. May they never be forgotten. We know that all are now safely cocooned in your love 
and eternal glory in another world on another shore. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to come to a time as we share in the bread and wine together. The peace of the Lord be always with you, also with you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. So as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. And so with your whole church, throughout the whole world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus delighted in drawing his friends to him and revealing to them the Father. And as they asked him about prayer, as they watched him pray and realised that he prayed with such relationship, with such beauty, they asked him how to pray, and he taught them this prayer. Let's say together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we're many, we're one body, because we all share in one bread. We're just going to pause for a moment and just still our hearts as we ask God to come and stir us. And uh, then we're going to just pray this prayer before we sh share bread. And I'm just going to plug my computer in so that it doesn't run out of power. <laughs> Excuse me for one second.
if you've got some bread and wine, you may want to take this opportunity in a moment to come and share with us in an agape, agape style. Is in a moment I share this bread and wine. But if not, you can pray this prayer as a sign of receiving Christ into your heart in this time of spiritual communion. Let's pray together. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart. O oh, merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen. Generous Lord, in word and Eucharist, we have proclaimed the mystery of your love. Help us so to live out our days, that we may be signs of your wonders in the world, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Let's use this prayer together as we've shared in this feast, this invitation from Jesus to come and feed on him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your disciples, I am with you always. Be with me today as I offer myself to you. Hear my prayers for others and for myself and keep me in your care. Amen. We continue together. O oh God, help me to trust you. Help me to know that you are with me. Help me to believe that nothing can separate me from your love revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In a moment, I'm going to say kind of a prayer of dismissal, and we're going to finish, um, as I said afterwards, with this beautiful um, rec recording, an a cappella recording from brothers and sisters in India, in the church there. Thank you for watching with us today. Sorry about the technical difficulties of sound, such as the joys of live streaming over the internet. Hopefully those will, gremlins will be sorted out uh, next time. Next week, we're uh, a recorded service uh, as we have been doing. We're gonna alternate recordings and then live streaming from the church here. So next week on YouTube, uh, there'll be a recorded service with intercessions and readings and a sermon and some music uh, recorded by Jules, our organist. So do hope that you will be able to watch us. If you came late to this service, you can always rewind it. Whenever on a live stream, you're able to rewind to the beginning or go to any point. Uh, that's a wonderful thing of live streaming. But we do hope that you're able to join with us, whether virtually or in our coffee mornings or knowing that we are praying together as family at some of our prayer times. These words of dismissal before our final hymn. In darkness and in light, in trouble and in joy, send us and help us, Heavenly Father, to trust your love, to serve your purpose and to praise your name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.